Hi, everybody. Well, I was going to say, I'm going to be around for like Welcome to time. today's Civic Life Lunch. Um, we're asking the question today, can libraries save democracy? I'm Shirley Mark, and I'm the Director of Community Partnerships for Tisch College. I'm also the Assistant Dean for Diversity and Inclusion for Tisch College. And I am very passionate about public libraries, and so I'm really happy to be here. And my only role today is to introduce our speakers. We want to begin by thanking our co-sponsors in political science and the Tufts Republicans. Thank you for your support. As many of you know, this semester, we are centering our speakers and events on the fight for democracy. This is an issue that many of us are familiar with and concerned about. We are focused on individuals and initiatives who are fighting for democracy by defending it, expanding it, and by strengthening it. And we are looking for solutions wherever we can. At this time, when democracy feels fragile, libraries have increasingly become spaces not only for books and educational programs, but also they serve a vital role in our civic life and in our broader communities. One of Tufts campuses, our health sciences campus is located in Boston's Chinatown. And Boston's Chinatown lost its library in 1956. And it didn't have a library for many, many decades. Soon after when Tisch College was founded a little more than 20 years ago, the teens in Chinatown started asking, why don't we have a library? They just didn't know, it just like popped in their mind, like why do we have to go down the street to the main library? And then they learned about how the library was lost and never rebuilt. So Tisch College actually did some work with them. We sent Tisch scholars, and Tufts students to help them with organizing efforts for a Chinatown library. Our senior fellow for the public humanities also did a public humanities exhibit that was focused on the press. And successful, well, the community successfully organized for a temporary library, but they are still fighting for a permanent library. So this is just really close to our hearts and certainly to my work in community partnerships. Mm -hmm. I want to introduce our speakers now. Um, Tamara King is the Chief Equity and Engagement Officer for the Richland County Library in South Carolina. That's Tamara. She is tasked with the development and support of the library's equity, diversity, and inclusion initiatives, their programs, partnerships, and ensuring that community engagement efforts reach the most underserved and marginalized populations. Shanley and Tanya, please come sit down. Tamara also supports the library's award-winning Let's Talk Race team, which has held discussions for more than 3,000 participants. I think you said 4,000. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we met earlier and she said 4,000, which is really amazing. King is co-chair of the Committee on Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Social Justice for the Public Library Association, a subset of the American Library Association. And she was recognized in 2019 as a library journal mover and shaker for her role in Rich Richland Library's race, equity, and social awareness work. We are also joined today by the Waltham Public Library Director, Kelly Linehan. Waltham is just one town over really, it's basically our neighbor. Kelly has over 20 years of urban public library experience with a special focus on service to the unhoused and mentally ill populations. She is currently the Massachusetts Library Association State Rep for the New England Library Association and she is a past president of the Minuteman Library Network, which many of us are parts of, members of. <laughs> Linehan is the creator of the award-winning Watch, Read, Listen Community Story Program and Play, Imagine, Experience Space. 
an interactive museum inspired immersive environment where children play and learn. And then moderating today's discussion is our very own Dorothy Meany. Dorothy is the director for the Tisch Library here at Tufts, so many of you may have seen her face before. Dorothy's public service and library career includes service as a trustee to her local public library, local history museum, and board of education in Madison, New Jersey. She is past president of the Boston Library Consortium, and she leads Tufts Libraries in meeting up the values of community, curiosity, openness, and social justice. And with that, I welcome all our speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shirley. Welcome, everyone. I'm really looking forward to an interesting discussion yeah. today. Yeah. Um, and I'd like to start off just by asking each of you to tell us a little bit about what drew you to work in public libraries. Sure. So I've been I'm a library lifer. I've worked in libraries my entire life. I actually started working in libraries in high school. Um, as a page shelving books and begging to use the checkout scanner and I actually one day I asked our teen librarian I said so you know what's what's up with actually being a librarian like how does that work and so he gave me the whole thing about you got to get a master's degree and some people specialize and went on and on he's like you know Kelly that's a this is a great question like is this something you think you want to do when you grow up and I was like Dave I'd rather die than be a librarian. <laughs> <laughs> true story and here I am today I was a really smart high schooler um and I think I, I genuinely, as cheesy as it sounds, feels like being a librarian is a calling. I think it's a love of, um, I do love books and I'm an avid reader. It's got nothing to do with that. We do not read at work, how, how I wish we did, but uh, right. But I, I think a love of people and, and interest in their, their stories. Um, and I think also being a naturally curious person really helps. But um, I tried. I tried to get out of libraries. I mean, I, I, I had a lot of career ideas. Um, when I got the job in Waltham, my dad said to me, um, you know, it's not too late to go to law school. And I was like, <laughs> I, I think it is, Dad. I, I think it is. But I, that's a whole other story. But yeah, so I think that's how for me, it just felt like a calling. And I feel like libraries are magic. I genuinely feel like I have a 90% happiness rate at, at work-ish. Um, I really love my job. I feel very fortunate to, to work in public libraries. How about you? Yeah. Um, mine is an interesting story because my career has had many lives. I was a radio DJ in high school for a country oh radio station, worked overnight. I don't know how my mom let me do that at 16. Um, but I went from there and I did television news for about five years. And then I went to do PR. And I remember I was having this late night conversation uh, with my best friend and her husband. It was like 12 o'clock at night. And, you know, she said, what would you do if you weren't afraid? Like if, if money wasn't an option, if you could just throw caution to the wind, what would you do? And most people are going to say like, jump out of a plane or I don't know, you know, start their own business. And I said, I'd go to library school. And um, it was like crickets. <laughs> like nobody understood. <laughs> She's like, what? And I said, I just love the idea of marrying the PR work that I've done, the communications work that I've done with this opportunity to help people level playing fields. Mm -hmm. Because I think libraries are the great equalizer. And I wanted to be able, there's so many libraries out there who don't have their own PR person or who don't have access to having uh, the funds to fund a PR department. And I wanted to be able to lend my skills to helping libraries tell their story in a meaningful way. Um, and I've been able to do that since I graduated. I went back to school at 30. And um, <laughs> I went back to school and got my MLIS and I have not looked back. It's been the best decision I ever did. See, it's a calling. It's a calling. It's a calling. <laughs> So the title of our talk today is kind of provocative, right? Mm -hmm. Can libraries save democracy? It's assuming, first of all, that democracy needs to be saved mm -hmm. um, and that libraries can be part of it. Um, and I think when we think of libraries and democracy and the role that they play, um, sometimes we think about the controversies, right? The recent attempts to shut down programming or book banning, things like that. Um, but public libraries in particular play a role in upholding and defending democracy there information, sources of information. They are polling places, they're places for communities to gather. Um, they offer training in all kinds of um, 
functions that make for active citizens. So I'd like to hear from each of you. <laughs> Can libraries save democracy? And if so, how? I don't think libraries can save democracy by themselves. I don't think democracy works that way, right? The whole point of democracy is that there are lots of hands moving this thing forward, right? Um, but I do think we have a unique role to play. I think we, um, when you read the Library Bill of Rights, which was written in what, 1950 something, um, and you, you read the Freedom to Read, that was written in like, no, sorry, Library Bill of Rights started in 1930, and then the Freedom to Read was like the 50s, maybe. Um, when you read those documents, you realize that these challenges that we're experiencing, they're nothing new. This is not new territory. It feels new to us because this is probably the first time we've had these kind of challenges as um, played on our television screens in such uh, repetition where you're seeing it every day when you turn on the news, but it's not something new. And this is the core work of libraries and what we, we do and how we represent, how we show up in, in the work towards democracy. Um, so no, I don't think we can save it by ourselves, but I definitely think we continue to have a role to play when you talk about the information marketplace and making sure that people have access to information that is factual, unbiased, and able to inform how they live their lives and who they vote for. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I would agree with everything Tamara said. And we were, you know, a library really is created to be the, the foundation of what democracy looks like. And we really, you know, to use your words, we're in a really unique position to give people access to this information um, and to not only make factual um, and relevant and timely information available, but to go out to the people who may not feel comfortable using our services or may not know about the public library as we know it here, um, particularly in Massachusetts, that we're doing that outreach to, to connect people, making sure they have their tools, um, the tools that they need to be a functioning, for all of us to be a functioning democracy. Um, and I, I think too, one thing I think we always think about it at our library is we're really responsible for the ages um, of before formal schooling starts, right? So before you're actually in kindergarten or, or maybe like a, a funded preschool, um, going to any type of preschool or daycare is really a privilege that not everybody, um, probably the majority of people don't have access to. And some of the things that those, you learn in daycare or preschool are things that we would cover um, in general for free, right? It's really the, the very start of critical thinking skills with our story hours and our programs. I think, you know, people have a glossy image of what that what that is and <laughs> sing-alongs and it is all that wonderful glossy stuff too, but it really is fundamentally starting these kids at a, at starting everybody at a very young age, regardless of um, economic background or um, languages spoken at home and really making those, those early connections. Yes, and I heard this quote recently that said, um, we often say children are a future, which is true, but parents build that future. Mm -hmm. And so I think it is really important too, as we're working on creating um, this experience for a young child and creating lifelong learning, we also are there to support parents, parents that may not have been lifelong learners, parents who may have felt disenfranchised by the system, parents who encounter certain barriers that libraries create options and accessibility for those parents, not even parents, but people in general who are kind of looking for a space where they can feel welcomed, they can learn, they can have access, and that we're reaching out to them at the same time. So I think, yes, children are bread and butter in libraries, but I also think there's such a an important part that we can play to helping um, whole people, helping to, to make the whole person and being thoughtful about that. What are some of the barriers that libraries and library staff face in doing this kind of outreach or reaching different segments of the community? So many. <laughs> I think what we constantly get, we have social workers at our library. And one of the things that we've seen as of late, people don't think we should be swimming in this exact pool. Um, they think that we should just do books or we should just do story time or we should just do um, the business of what traditionally they believe a library should be doing. That doesn't change our focus. That doesn't change our goal. But we're going to talk about homelessness. We're going to talk about people experiencing homelessness. We're going to talk about affordable housing in our community. We're going to talk about social justice. We're going to talk about equity. 
we're not going to shy away from those things. But I think that's been the biggest challenge is people thinking that it's a little bit of mission creep for us. And I, I think for me, at a pretty urban public library, we face endless challenges. Waltham, um, if you're not familiar with it, 40% of families in Waltham speak a language other than English at home, predominantly Spanish speakers. Um, so, you know, language is a pretty, pretty easy one that we need to be really conscious of. Um, socioeconomic backgrounds, the ability to actually travel to the library. Waltham just has one main library. Uh, Waltham has a large population of um, um, food insecurity with, with children. And um, even that alone, right, is when they come to some of your programs or after school programs, I think you forget that a hungry kid can't really concentrate and they sure as heck can't behave. Um, so we, we have to battle so many little things like that. We have a very large homeless population. They have very specific needs um, that need to be met just to kind of just to kind of get them the books. There's there's these core things that um, many of us take right. would take for granted. I also think our staff, um, majority of my staff comes from a relatively privileged background that um, requires quite a bit of training to get in the headspace of working with the mentally ill, um, working with, you know, having a trauma-based approach to how we um, connect with our, our patrons. I was gonna say something else about, um, I drift off, it'll come back to me. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I echo everything she just said. Yeah. yeah. All those things. A lot, things of, barriers, a lot of barriers. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Our own biases. <laughs> that's what yeah. I was going to say. Right. Or just start your own personal biases. Um, I, we actually had a teen who was talking about going to college and what he wanted to do for college. And he keeps talking, but he's there every day after school and he was talking about BU. Um, and he, he got like a C in chemistry. And I was like, I had said to the teen librarian, I was like, hey, by the way, you need to grab him and take him aside and just let, you know, let's start talking to him about his chemistry class because you don't go to BU with a C in chemistry. Like, what on earth is he talking about? Um, and my teen librarian said, you know, Kelly, you have to remember, he doesn't have the same home support that you had when you were thinking about going to college. He doesn't understand, like, he really didn't understand what going to college meant and where um, some of the limitations were in terms of grades and what, what that access like, you know, the things that to get into Tufts, there are a lot of requirements to get into BU. There are a lot of requirements. And he's from a family that nobody went to college before. He has nobody guiding him through that process. And even, you know, I try to do my best to stay aware of my own privilege in these situations. But that was certainly a moment just a few weeks ago where I was like, oh, my gosh, you're right. I need to come at this from a, a totally, um, totally different angle. So well, it does sort of speak to like you said, the mission creep potential. Yeah. Or meeting people's needs. We'll switch gears for a second. Um, so 48 states, including Massachusetts and South Carolina, um, protect the conf confidentiality of library users' information by law. Why is it important to have these laws in place, especially in a democracy? Um, and what would libraries and library users lose if that were not the case? <laughs> I mean, honestly, it's such an overwhelming thought to think that that could even be a reality um, in some places. It, 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 like, it's my librarian heart is for <laughs> like, with the, with this idea. Like, yeah. it's really too much to think about. I mean, I I think of all the things that you know, yeah, all your natural curiosity and and things that you want to learn about being. I just that's just not a democracy, right? People need to have access to. Um, I'm not doing a great job of this because I'm letting my emotions uh, come forward. I don't know. Honestly, it's a hard, I feel very fortunate to live in Massachusetts and to have that as a legally protected right. Um, I also, I mean, you would lose the core of who libraries are and what we represent to our community if we lost that privacy. Mm -hmm. um, we believe that people have access the ability to have access and convenient access to information. And so when you start talking about uh, removing privacy, then we're not really America anymore because it's based on the First Amendment rights and all these other things. So um, I think I'm glad that 48 states uphold it. What are the two that- I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm curious. I don't want to guess. So I don't work there, you know. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just curious what, what two those are um, and what does that look like? But I think it's been very important for us to making sure that we really maintain privacy when it comes to um, who has a library card and what they read. 
Because if we lose that, we lose the trust in the public that we are this space where people can access information without judgment. Do you think it's different? So is there a different sense around privacy given the technology that we are all immersed in? I was just going to add that I think um, I think as a library, we don't do, PR is our weak spot, as you mentioned, we do need professional PR people. We don't do a great job explaining to the public how carefully we protect your, your privacy rights and how hugely we fight behind the scenes to make sure that that right is protected. Um, and like you said, it would probably be the collapse of society, really and truly, without exaggeration, right? That This is, your right to privacy is really, um, it's a civil liberty. That being said, I think with technology, the fingerprints, the face ID, um, I, I think we're very quickly, we're lacking a little bit in, in media literacy. And I, I think there's, that's a, that makes sense, right? It, that's a natural part of just the world that we live in. And historically, we have seen that. There's a slow growth towards all this. In other words, technology changes so rapidly, but we do, we are going to take time to sort of catch up and get nice safety nets and parameters in place for that. Um, but it does make me nervous, right? People are so quick to just go into the Apple store and put their fingerprint in and walk away and like no problem there. Um, my husband is one of those people and it drives me. I'm always like, I will not put my fingerprint in anything because <laughs> that's not how I roll. Um, but I, right, it does, it makes you think, and especially with some of the, the kids, right? The, the, the younger generations, they're so fluent in technology and social media and using these devices, but really making sure that they're able to take a minute and think through what the ramifications are having all that information. Um, just that just that fingerprint out, out, out and about, right? Your face, face identity. And I think too, we give up so much uh, to be in the world that we're in, mm -hmm. right? In, in order to have access to websites or information or streaming or whatever, right? To have a phone, absolutely, you give absolutely. up so much. Yeah. But there are certain people who don't want to participate in technology. Yeah. So where do they go? If you really are someone who wants your privacy and it is very important to you and you don't, yes, you're sharing your, you know, you're not wanting to share your fingerprint or your face or any of those things and you really want that, where other institution can you go Absolutely. where you have access to that kind of privacy and you have, it's your right as you walk in the door to that privacy. There aren't many places. And so I always think we give up so much. Um, this is the one place that it's in our it's in our bylaws, it's in our DNA that here you don't have to give that up. That's it's actually a really great point. Yeah. You mentioned media literacy. Uh, last week, I think it was last week, um, Tisch College had another similar event about misinformation. Mm -hmm. um, and according to our colleagues here at Circle, the Center for Information for Research on Civic Learning and Engagement. 50, only 53% of teens have learned about media literacy or how to analyze media or news. Mm -hmm. And there are um, demographic differences mm -hmm. too. So um, black teens, rural teens, those whose parents haven't had gone to college um, are even less likely to have this level of media literacy. So what can libraries do, public libraries, to ensure that space is made for young people to develop those skills, media literacy skills? I think it is it goes back to a little bit of the PR problem that libraries have. Um, I don't sometimes, not all the time, but I don't know if we do a good enough job of making information look cool um, or civic life look cool, like a cool thing to do and to be a part of the system. Um, and so I, I think in general, libraries have a hard time sometimes reaching teens. So aside from that part of the engagement, if you can't even get them in the door, or you can't even engage with them about a fun book there they need to read. Sometimes it's hard to do that part too. Um, I think I really am I'm all for libraries creating campaigns. We just did a campaign at our library, a welcome back campaign to let people know that our doors were still open after the pandemic, after being shut down. We did commercials. We had staff singing on those commercials. We did a social media campaign. I mean, we put thousands of dollars I won't say it too loud for the county council <laughs> listening, um, but we did a significant investment in making sure that this, this worked. And we saw a significant increase in the amount of people who signed up for library cards, the people that started coming back into our buildings. So we had a very targeted approach. And I feel like when it comes to reaching teens in general, there's an opportunity for libraries in libraries specifically, public libraries, to have a targeted approach to reaching out and uh, there's a saying in the South that I don't know if y'all have it up here, like put it out for the goats to get it. 
No? Oh, God. Okay. Um, well, that's something that we say in the South, uh, meaning that you put it to where you can get people to be engaged in what you're trying to sell them. So you put it out so the goats can get it. And then, then once you've got them in, then you can start building more about civic life and voting and information literacy. But you have to get them in the door. And that's been a challenge, I think, at least for our library. I can't speak for all. So it, in our library, we actually have a very strong team program. We, um, my library had started um, a program called Real Talk. So it's sort of a youth conversation forum led by the teens. And it's a year long curriculum um, that it, it covers a lot of things, but it does cover sort of media literacy in the sense that it, so some broader topics like um, safety, sexuality, um, gender, and looking at that and evaluating all the information that's coming to the teens, how they feel about it, um, sorry, how they feel about the information coming to them, evaluating that information, um, and sort of making decisions moving forward from that, if that makes sense. Um, so we do a lot of civic works at my particular library. We currently have a Four Freedoms um, exhibit on our front lawn, and there's there's it's, um, a national program that talks about um, um, freedom to, freedom from, freedom for, and another freedom. Freedom, freedom of, all, right? freedom of. Um, sorry about that. Um, this is a very bad library there. Um, but it, all the kids at the high school um, fill out like yard signs, like political yard signs, and we have them all over our lawn with the as most important to the teens. Um, different from media literacy, right? But having them thinking civic mindedly. Yeah. Um, and I think also separate from the teens, right? When you're working with a library, particularly reference librarians, you know, research librarians, you know, their job is to be very intentional um, in terms of helping, helping you get at um, really the heart of your question. Because I think people come in with one question and a good librarian is trained to really break down that question for you and pull out any, any bias that you might have, any bias in the sources that you're looking for. Um, it's interesting. I was just helping a woman on the desk about a diet book, and that was a tricky one because I was a little bit like, I feel like we don't want to go down this 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 train, but that's you know, it's not wasn't for me to say. Um, but I think in little ways like that, we really try to to tackle it as well. Because to your point, and I know some libraries, I'm sure, do a really great job of this hosting, like media literacy 101 for teens is going to draw zero no. teens, at least in my community. It's a lot of things like, like it doesn't eating work. the pizza, <laughs> they'd be like, doesn't no, work. No, that's not right. So you try to do it a lot more subtly. And like I was saying earlier, too, even with um, kids, obviously, you're not doing it so much with social media, but you're trying to build critical thinking skills, which such an, are such an important element of, um, of democracy, of media literacy, like learning to think, um, well, I was going to say learning to think critically, right? But just really learning how to think. That it is a skill. It's a muscle that needs to be exercised, and it's not something um, actively taught. What's your engagement like? like? We have a huge number of teens. Awesome. Um, we usually see about anywhere from 50 to 70 kids after school, um, which is a huge. We have a middle school within walking distance um, for us, so we, we see a huge amount of teens. They're a lot. They're wonderful. <laughs> They're a lot. How did you build your base? Like, how did you start promoting it and making it something that's attractive? I had a I'm wonderful. Um, <laughs> no, it's, I, I had a wonderful team library, and he actually just moved to be a director um, in another part of the state. But he um, really made it kid forward. And and actually, this program was one of the high school students had an idea about having like sort of a shared conversation group, kind of in lieu of a book group. Um, and he just went with whatever they said and just kind of let them take the ball and and roll with it and it just spiraled into this it's like basically a literally a year-long curriculum and we have kids high school kids actually lead the conversations they're trained we pay them to participate so they're actually paid um, to guide the you know they're trained and paid to be facilitators with the staff oversight on the side we don't allow parents to come in any any grown-up for lack of a better word that comes in to give a presentation or talk to the kids are fully vetted um, by us behind the scenes, but also by the team leaders, the Real Talk leaders, to make sure that they feel like this is somebody they want to bring into their peers. Um, so it's really teen led, and I think that's an important part of um, let let teens lead the way and then just support them. So let's talk about COVID for a minute because that impacted a lot of things, um, and libraries are among other things sources of public health information. So can you talk a little bit about how your libraries handled 
things over the course of the pandemic, especially in the beginning, and how that impacted your ability to provide public health information to people? Um, I think, go oh, please, please. Okay. <laughs> um, there was so much information changing all the time. Um, and so we did have a crisis communication team um, of, comprised of staff from different uh, jobs that were important to the work we were doing, like our human resources department was on it, our marketing folks were on it, our operations people, our events people, like all of the people that needed to be in the room as we were talking about COVID um, and how to keep our library safe. When we shut our doors in March of 2020. I foolishly thought we would be back in two weeks, yeah. maybe four mm -hmm. at the most. I didn't anticipate you know, six, seven, eight months of, of shuttering our doors and having to do curbside service and having to virtual programming and all the things that we had to shift to. I think one of the things that I know everybody hates the word pivot because everybody kept using it during mm -hmm. COVID, but we had to be extremely nimble and flexible and never forget our goal, which is to provide access to information and to help our communities uh, find what they need and be resources. And so we've constantly kept that at the front. It may change how we do that and how it has changed how we've done that. And now we're trying to kind of go to hybrid um, where we still do virtual programming, but now we're starting to do in-person programming. We had the welcome back campaign to let people know we were back. Um, but you know, South Carolina is just a different space. Um, I think, I don't know how it was when it came to wearing masks here. I don't know how Massachusetts fared, um, but it was it was something that got so contentious when people were walking through our doors and we were asking them to wear masks. Um, even talking about vaccine and, and enlightening people about what was available to them and educating them about just vaccine literacy and health literacy, not necessarily, of course, we couldn't advocate for it, nor would we. But I think that was the hardest part was trying to get over some of the political um, information or political, um, I don't know what the right word is, but some of the politics that were included in just keeping people healthy or trying to keep people healthy. We did get a grant to, um, we did a really targeted campaign to get African-American males um, and African-American families aware of or just letting them know about some of the health opportunities that was available to them through COVID. We did a grant, get a grant to do that. We did commercials on Spotify and a few other things mm -hmm. to really push that, that message. Not that we were pushing getting a vaccine, but definitely the access to it. And we also have virtual health clinics and did um, vaccine clinics at the library as well. Mm -hmm. What was it like? Um, similar, um, without the very awesome campaigns. Um, but I, I will say Waltham, I don't want to necessarily speak for Waltham, but I do think there's a difference um, depending on the community and the socioeconomic makeup of that community of how COVID mm -hmm. um, not was handled, right, but was was maybe accepted by the community. And I think the ability to argue about COVID and express your opinion about COVID, express your opinion about wearing a mask or getting a vaccine um, and having all these opinions is a, comes from a place of privilege. Um, I, I feel like I've said that a lot today, but it is true for a lot of people, all this information coming to them on about COVID um, was primarily in English and mm -hmm. on the news um, and being politicized, right? Um, so for a lot of our patrons, they were like, anywho, we'll put a mask on. We just want to grab some books. And that was great. Like, I, I feel very fortunate. You know, we did the same thing. We shared information about when, you know, the vaccines and we shared information as shared to us by the public health um, departments and the CDC and all that other good stuff. We did a lot of a lot of outreach. You know, we would drive books to people's houses if they wanted. Yeah. We did the curbside pickup. We did online story times. We did all the right stuff. But mostly I didn't find that our patrons were um, trying to push any boundaries. I, I find that I I have serve a very grateful community who are are just glad to um, I don't want that to come out as belittling. They're just a very grateful, kind community. And I really appreciate that. I, I felt like, especially amongst my Minuteman colleagues, I was the president of Minuteman during um, sort of the brunt of COVID. It was one of the worst, <laughs> worst times. I feel like that's a, it's a cakewalk job. And then I got the one year there's a global pandemic. Um, but I did feel like really comparatively some of these towns um, having the time to write a letter to complain about the mask policy at the library. I mean, that's a privilege, right? Like a lot of people are busy working 
living their lives and could care less about that. So I found I found that I was grateful for the gratitude that was shown. People were just very happy to come in and get their get their materials and do an online program and, and stuff like that. So were your staff considered essential workers in terms of showing up in person? We fought really hard um, with our legislative body as well as our city council and county council for us to be considered that way. Um, they considered us essential workers, but when it came time for uh, the county to give money using their ARPA funds to uh, give it to our staff for those of us that had worked during that time, uh, they said, well, if we give it to you, then we'd have to give it to all millage agencies if they worked. Like if we'd have to give it to Midlands Tech or, or the zoo or, you know, a mental health, a number of other organizations. So they did give it to their county staff, but because we were not officially county staff, we did not qualify. We did get a lot of ARPA funds and continue to get ARPA funds for other things. So I think it kind of, uh, we used, we had like $400,000 uh, that they reimbursed us through ARPA funding that we were able to use to help our staff. And so for us, we were considered essential employees. We went back to the library in, in sort of a weird fashion of like one group in one week, one group the other week instead of a work from home switch. Um, and I, I will say that we, my entire staff kept their jobs, um, which is certainly a credit um, to the city for sure. That is not the case across the board for our local libraries, which was very concerning to see. Um, and, you know, other than everybody's safety, that was probably my biggest concern was going to be worried about that. So um, yeah. I feel very fortunate about that. I think with the essential employees, though, too, it's interesting. My husband works for a grocery store. And I will tell you, there are two different types of essential employees. So in the, the really in the start of COVID and sort of moving on um, from that, um, I don't know. I have a lot of, I think a lot of personal feelings. I had a, a, a newly turned one-year-old and a three-year-old at home. Oh, my God. Um, but I just feel like having a husband going to a grocery store every day mm -hmm. and what he had to deal with mm -hmm. to me is like, I didn't, I, I really, you have to question what is essential and what is not in some of those early on moments. But I do, looking back, knowing what I know now, I was glad we went back, we went back in July um, and we were just doing the curbside pickup. I feel really good about that. Like I, I actually, I'm glad we were able to do that um, and, and help people that way as well. You went back in July of 2020. We went back in July of 2020. Yeah. But we're at just the curbside. Yeah. Um, we were back in like uh, September, November. Yeah. Doing, we were doing curbside. Sure. But we yeah. were officially open. Yeah. I didn't feel so great about it. Yeah, like July 3rd. Mm -hmm. I was not in a great mood. But I did. I, in looking back, I can say that I was right. wrong and I was glad that we had made that decision. Sorry. Well, thank you. Um, so let's talk about the programs that you each have spearheaded in your libraries. Or let's talk race and so watch, read, listen. Watch, listen. Watch, yes. listen. Yeah. Um, so there are, there is still this sense among some that libraries are sort of quiet spaces for self-education. Mm -hmm. And these programs are not that, right? That mm -hmm. challenges that idea that that's the purpose of libraries. Can you talk a little bit about what, um, what motivated you to put these programs in place and how you got traction, given that um, it's maybe seen as outside vision? Mm -hmm. Sure. So I had brought up Watch, Read, Listen, um, and it's our version of the community-wide um, read. But in Watch, Read, Listen, you don't have to read a book. Um, you're experiencing a story as a whole community. So the idea is that um, one example is we did Hamilton for our Watch, Read, Listen program. Um, and so you could read the... Um, Oh my gosh, I was just talking about this and I can't remember his name, the big tome of Hamilton um, mm -hmm. based on the movie, or there's a million different spinoffs, everything from graphic novels, you can read it in many, many languages, you can listen to the soundtrack, you could get a, you know, a, you get a DVD of Hamilton now, you can see the show, all sorts of fun stuff surrounding the idea of that. And then sort of getting into the, the um, this was actually a great option, but the idea is you don't have to be able to read at all, right? Or, and you don't actually have to speak English to participate in the story. So we try to make it as inclusive um, as possible. And part of the impetus for that for me was um, I came over to Waltham for working in Cambridge and I loved my time there. But their community read um, was always very, uh, it was very highbrow. Um, and I, I do think sometimes, I think we need the community read to be a little bit more fun. Um, there, these are two different towns, so I get it. But I remember, like we did one year, we did um, three cups of tea, 
Um, and I was like, that's a, that's a little much. Like, oh, well, I don't know. It, it just feel like it's not, it doesn't appeal to everybody, right? You can't have a program like that and say, three cups of tea applies. Uh, is Everybody's going to want to read this book. Um, versus Hamilton, quite frankly, everybody wanted to check out, um, everybody wanted to check out Hamilton. Um, so that's part of the, the goal of it is to make it as inclusive as possible. We buy baby board books. So even the, you know, the youngest can um, participate. And we hosted a number of programs that address um, what we would describe as sort of any of the controversies maybe in the book, right? We want to look at elements of, of racism in the story, um, um, the Manuel Miranda's decisions um, in terms of his, not staffing, but the casting, casting thank you. Um, and we delved, delved into like the, the whole history, history there. We took a whole lot of um, music, spent a lot of time looking at music from um, a diverse angle. And I feel like it helps us really literally experienced that story of Hamilton in a much broader and open sense. The first year we did it, we did the Jungle Book and we tackled a lot of elements of the racism in that story, which was really powerful. Um, and so, you know, you want to have a little bit of controversy, but also something sort of enjoyable that everybody can really um, access. Um, so that is sort of the impetus behind that. And we had a re really record-breaking number of people who came to participate in the program because you know, for the first time, you really could, right? It wasn't just, I don't know, it, it just feels nicely inclusive and there's no awkward embarrassment of having to explain that um, you can't read and, or you don't read in English, right? Because we just had multiple copies of everything in all sorts of styles available for people um, that a librarian could help them find, but also they could just self-select. We do a big display so people can browse it and see what fits their needs um, as well. Watch a DVD, whatever, whatever works for you. It was very, it's very fun. Yeah, it sounds fun. Yeah. I love Hamilton too. So it was a, yeah, I think everybody loves it. Everybody. Yeah. I also like that book for cups of tea. So that's it's a good it's a good book. It's, it's, not, good. I'm, it's like, not everybody's cup of tea. Um, <laughs> back in 2015, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the case with Walter Scott when he a black man was shot in the back running from the police. Uh, it was one of the first times you got a chance to see, uh, other than Rodney King, um, what it is really like when um, Black people interact sometimes with, or people of color interact with the police department. And so that happened in 2015 in North Charleston, which is about maybe like an hour and a half away from Columbia. And then three or four months later in June, we had the Emanuel Nine happen where nine parishioners were killed in a church in North Charleston, same community. We knew a lot of the people. I personally knew some of the people that were killed that day. Um, and the whole point of the person shooting that church, uh, Dylan Roof, was to start a race war, right? Um, and, and instead, our community, instead of starting that race war, we were really connected for a little while. It even got the Confederate flag down, which my father has been working, a number of people have been working in South Carolina to get removed from the State House Dome. Um, but then Black Lives Matter came. And then there were like just people just not talking to each other. And there was such, we'd gone from unity to division so quickly um, when everybody was really unified about the fact that it's, it's a bad idea to start a race war by shooting people in a church while they're in Bible study. Um, we all agreed upon that. We all agreed that Dylan Roof wore the Confederate flag around his chest as a symbol of hate and not a symbol of heritage, which we constantly hear about with the Confederate flag. So we all agreed upon that, but then things started to shift. And our library had a really important question. Our staff asked us how we were gonna respond. We had the Pulse nightclub shooting um, and there were other events. There was Philando Castile and so many others uh, that were impacted by police brutality or just arriving in America and being in America while black. And so our staff kept asking, or just different. Um, and so staff asked us a question like, how are we gonna respond? What are we here for? We can't be neutral about this. We can't be neutral about hatred. We can't be neutral about uh, division and not being a place that welcomes everybody. We can't be neutral about this. And so we started the Let's Talk Race team. It was officially called, initially called Social Justice Team, um, Social Awareness Team. And we started talking about everything from women's rights, social justice. We were holding facilitated conversations. Um, we're calling them um, circles of dialogue. 
And people would sit in a, tur a circle and there'd be a facilitator, a trained facilitator, and we would lead conversations and ask really bold questions, right? Um, and help people really talk about them in a meaningful way. Uh, we got to race. Uh, we just couldn't get off of it because we are the South. We live in South Carolina and race seemed to be the beginning of it all. And before you could talk about social justice, before you could talk about women's rights, we needed to talk about that. And so our facilitation of, uh, we trained our facilitators, we trained staff, they're from all walks of the library. We have managers, we have um, front end staff, we have back of house staff. Uh, you have chief, a chief equity officer like myself, which that wasn't the title I had at the time, but you had all kinds of people in administration, you had a shelver, um, anyone who wanted to do this work or we felt like had interest in learning how to be a facilitator. And so we started that and to date, like I, I think when Shirley talked about it earlier, we've had uh, about 4,000 people go through it in some way or learned about Let's Talk Race and the work that we do. We're, right now we've raised $140,000 to do a curriculum through grants and resources from our friends and foundation. Um, the curriculum will teach people how to have those conversations about race. And um, it's a facilitation guide. It will also have videos for people who don't wanna ask those hard questions. If you don't wanna ask, is it okay to touch a black person's hair? If you don't wanna ask, how did you first learn about difference? If you don't wanna ask about monuments and should they be taken down and what that means, uh, our team will ask those questions and teach you how to have those conversations in a productive and meaningful way. That will be open source and available to the public in January 2023. So it started off as this really quick question of how do we respond in a conversation with my executive director uh, where I said, um, I don't know if y'all familiar with this term, it's from the movie Ghost. Y'all may be way too young for that. But, you know, I really went to her and I said, Molly, we in danger, girl. Y'all remember that part of the movie? So, you remember that part? So I was like, we're, we're in danger because our staff was really having a hard time with us taking this neutral stance. They felt like we weren't vocal enough. And I feel like because we did that work in 2016, when 2020 happened, we were ready. Um, we'd become very comfortable with uncomfortability. And so we were ready to have those conversations. That was a long answer. No, no, no. <laughs> wonderful. We have about 10 minutes left, so I think we're going to open the, uh, questions up to the audience if anyone has questions for our panelists. I was going to ask about banned books and how you're handling that, you know. Or not handling. <laughs> you know, we, we, we've had a lot of challenges in our state. Um, not necessarily our library. We have had challenges in our library, but not to the level of some of the people in the upstate or the different, like the upper part of our state. They've been having a lot of challenges as it relates to banned books and what people can put on the, the shelves. Um, that library has seen a lot, uh, but we have armed our staff. We have talking points. It talks about intellectual freedom. We've given that to our staff. We've um, had trainings about it as well. We're, we're always talking about it with our team so they understand that who we are and what we represent. And um, I think we've, we've constantly been sticking to the freedom to read as a guide for us, as well as the Library Bill of Rights. And these are things that we don't waver upon. Um, but we recently had someone take all of the books from a display, a pride display. They checked them out um, and it went viral because the library staff person couldn't believe that someone had checked out all these books in an effort to make sure no one else could check them out, um, which they don't even understand. It, all you're gonna do is trigger the system to yeah. order more books, right? Like, right. so it, really, it doesn't work out. I kind of tell everyone, right. that's not how, that's not activism. That's yeah. not the issue that you want. Um, it's like, all you did was just make it a really popular book, right? And, even if, yeah. and at some point you've got to return them, even though we don't have uh, late fees, we do have fines. If you don't return a book, yeah. you're gonna give it back. So I think, um, that's probably the most we've seen. We've also seen a lot of legislators want to, in fact, we just uh, had to deal with that where legislators were trying to get a bill passed uh, along with a big bill that would fund libraries more than we've ever been funded before from the state. But they were trying to get something about uh, not having books that were period in nature. Period in nature. And we were like, well, what does that mean? Like, there was no description. One senator got on the floor and said, well, under this, it means we can't have the Bible in there either, because that could be considered some moments that weren't exactly pure either. And so uh, those are the kind of challenges that we've been seeing, trying to pass those bills and getting those bills into to how they fund us. 
and making us kind of waver when it comes to funding. And I would just add to that that I feel a little bit more fortunate. I think in, in Massachusetts, we are a little bit more, I think, open-minded. We see a little bit less of that, but we've certainly seen a lot recently in Minuteman in terms of people protesting the, um, some of the libraries hosting a drag story time for yep. kids. Um, I think books are pretty regularly challenged. Like we said that they, through history, people have, have questioned books and their, their content. Um, I was just reading a study that's, I think, seven out of 10 voters, though, um, yeah. nationally say that they do not want any books banned from a public library. We see it a lot more often, I think, in school libraries, parents challenging that. Um, yeah. I, you know, I'm not fluent and stupid, but I do think that um, <laughs> if you don't like a book, you don't have to read it. Like, I, I feel like they're always like, librarians are peddling this stuff like... <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been to a library, but we're really not. We're doing our work and usually, you know, I don't know. Like I, it's, it's, I make light of it, but I try to think of like, we're, we've been doing this a long time. I feel like nothing, nothing enrages us. Well, there's a lot of things that work up librarians, maybe myself, right? right? right. But I, to be fair, but I do think like, we'll fight the censorship battle all you want, right? There is, we're, people need access to information. You don't have to read the book. You don't have to like the book. It's a lot of mysteries I don't like. I mean, I, you don't see me wiping out mysteries from the public library. <laughs> right. I don't read them. Westerns, I mean, I think we could probably do without them, save a little publishing money. But again, I keep my opinion to myself. It's not for me to decide what, what necessarily is or is right for you to personally um, to personally read. There was that story about Nora Roberts, so there's the library in Michigan that's going to take out... Um, a library in Michigan that removed funding for their library and Nora Roberts, who's a very famous romance writer, um, she came in and gave them like a ton of money, made $150,000 and was basically like, I'll 200 and, and I'll, she said, you just tell me what you need and I'll fund the rest of it because the town had defunded them. But I, I feel fortunate because in Massachusetts, um, the state really regulates towns and cities funding their libraries appropriately, not only funding their sort of baseline operational budgets, but also their materials budget has to grow every year. And they are very serious about, you will either take care of your libraries or we will take your library away, not give it state funding, and you will not be able to use any other neighboring libraries. Um, and it has happened, um, I don't wanna to name towns, but there are town, there are certainly towns in Massachusetts where we we told all their, their citizens, like they would come in and say, you know, my, I can't use my library because we're closed. Can I use your library? Our answer is no. You legally cannot use our library because your city and town did not fund it. And they do that to protect to protect your public libraries. And in my experience, this is more anecdotal. I don't have the date in front of me. Usually it's one year without your public library and you will see a political turnover in your um, whoever voted wrongly. Um, they, will, they will shift that and reopen within a year. I mean, it's not easy to get completely de decertified. That was the word I was looking for. Um, but it is certainly possible and we take that very seriously. Like, we'll forgive a lot of things. We won't do late fines, right? Like, we'll give you whatever you want, but you need to take care of your own library. It's a, that is a Massachusetts, I feel very lucky to have that be in place. It's not the same in Michigan is my understanding. Or um, South Carolina. Or South Carolina, see? I mean, it's a, it makes a big difference. Yeah, it's a big difference. There was a question in the back. Yeah, so I'm asking this on behalf of um, Linda, who's in the Zoom room, and she says, I just finished a course at the Framingham Library with UMass professors in literature, science, and politics. Do you find schools like Tufts are helping bring academics to the community through your libraries? This might be a good question for Dorothy, if you want to take it on. Places like Tufts, can you repeat the end of the question? Sure. Do you find schools like Tufts are helping bring academics to the community in your libraries? So um, I don't know that we're working with um, public libraries locally. So the, the libraries on this campus are, the Tisch Library is open to the public. And we do have community members that use it. And we have community partners that have library privileges at, at Tisch Library. And so there are um, strong connections like that that are important to us. I don't know if you work with any local universities. Yeah, so we have Bentley and Brandeis, um, and we do we do so we do work pretty collaboratively um, with both of them. Probably morely on a I don't want to say informal, but in many different ways. I feel like they've been really great allies um, to the public library for sure. Yeah, very very valuable. Good question. So I have a question about threat to democracy uh, with the local newspapers becoming completely 
unfunctional. They're just here in Massachusetts and being bought by regional papers. They're kind of like news that's kind of of interest, but there's nothing on political candidates, on races, on overrides, mm -hmm. you know, big issues for voters. Mm -hmm. We had in, in, in Medford, a woman who used to poll all the candidates, you know, give them a survey and then put that online. Do you see any way for libraries to do that? Or who can take over that vacuum? Because it really is disturbing in terms of going out to vote if you don't know who the candidates are and there's no public yeah, forum. Yeah. I think for Massachusetts, that's a, it'd be a really nice segue that public libraries um, should step in and, and fill. Um, I think it could be pretty easy sure. if they had a yeah, forum. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. We have a forum tomorrow um, for Richland School District. One is our school district. Uh, races and we have a forum we also have a partnership with the chamber the local chamber that has whoever's running for governor whoever's running for different uh, things that are upcoming we have it here at our library you know we have it at our library one of the things that we also adopted especially because of of covid we started something called teletown hall are you familiar with teletown hall it allows you to have um, pretty much like a telephone town hall. You call people, people pick up the phone. If they want to participate, they don't have to, but the library pays for this service. It's called Teletown Hall. Um, and we create a script and, uh, you know, have different people come and their voices heard and people can ask questions. And there's no need for it to be either on the phone. I mean, not on the phone. Uh, there's no digital component. So if you're not well versed when it comes to uh, digital or, cell phones or anything, it's just a phone. We, we call landlines and we call cell phones. And I say that because we had new county council members and we had them all on a phone call. We're also trying to get our two senators to have a teletown hall in December um, where people have an opportunity to ask those questions and find out about it. But we have been really vocal with making sure that people know who's running for office and being a space where those forums can happen. We did a mayoral forum, we've done all those things. I think we're going to have to let that be the last question. Sorry. I feel like we could sit here for another at least half an hour and yeah, we'll talk. But... Thank our speakers. They were thank amazing. You. All of you were amazing. Erin, Tamara, Dorothy. also want to thank Jess Burns and Shanley Daly who um, organized this forum. And um, to all of you for coming. Mm -hmm.